Thank you very much, Rod, and I'm very grateful to Tim Hirsch and the organizing committee of the GBIF annual, 21st annual meeting for inviting me here to talk a little bit about a story concerning the use of GBIF data for public health. So we've just heard about the use of GBIF data for food security, and now we want to talk about the use of GBIF data to keep people from getting diseases that they may be exposed to under uh, new climate regimes which may shift the distributions of disease vectors. So I want to first say that I was a co-author on a publication with a bunch of public health experts, of which I am absolutely not. And so I do know a little bit about modeling climate change impacts to species distributions, and I will do my best to convey uh, the story that I um, was part of together with a team of public health experts. So the story begins. OK, let's try that again. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle, I don't know what I just did. Is this not working, maybe? Yeah, hang on. Hang on. No problem. There we go. Okay, right. so this story begins with a really simple diagram to try to convey what is the interaction um, that leads to the emergence of a disease. There are several conditions that you have to have. There are conditions of the environment that have to be conducive to the existence of a pathogen. But those pathogens, we can almost, we very rarely can directly understand the distribution of those pathogens because they're residing in a host. And it's really the, the interaction of the environment, the host, and the pathogen when those, those conditions come together across those three different factors that we have the emergence of a disease. And so, of course, it makes absolute sense that under conditions of a changing environment, um, where we are now witnessing sort of unprecedented rates and magnitude of global change, and that is a, a condition to which we are committed now moving forward into the 21st century. So under those conditions of a changing environment, this, this sort of triumvirate, right, this trilogy of conditions is going to change itself. And in the world of public health, we most want to understand, you know, where are new diseases likely to emerge? It's a, it's a story, in public health, it's a story about preparedness, about anticipation. Do we understand where we might be exposed to diseases that we have not been exposed to before? And can we educate the public health community to anticipate the emergence of those diseases? So trying to predict the distribution of where new emerging infectious diseases may be has to do with understanding the relationship between a changing environment and the changing distribution of its hosts that are carrying pathogens. So there's a really active community that are looking at how a changing climate in particular is affecting the link between hosts and vectors and emerging infectious diseases. And um, so this is a, a really active area of research because there are literally lives at stake here. This is the, the health of communities, billions of dollars. I mean, it's actually quite... Um, relevant that we're in the midst of an Ebola um, sort of issue while I'm standing here giving this talk. We are all, we're witness right now to how these emerging infectious diseases are in fact costing us a lot in dollars and a lot in terms of, of the health of communities. So our particular contribution was about a series of viruses called the, the they're Hinepa viruses. So there's a, a Hendra virus and a Nipah virus. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. And Peter Daszak is the lead author. He's the president of EcoHealth Alliance based in New York City, which is pretty much the premier wildlife disease ecology organization in the world. And we had a very simple premise that vector-borne diseases are sensitive to changes in climate. And we wanted to understand for this particular um, series of vector-borne diseases, um, the distribution of those vectors, which are bats, depend largely on climate. And therefore, the disease distribution depends on the vector distribution. And we wanted to see if we could predict the potential distribution shifts of the disease vectors essentially as part of preventative public health measures. Can we anticipate where this emerging infectious disease might be appearing under conditions of future climates? So um, we looked at 15 different bat species that collectively harbor about 81 emerging infectious diseases, but we focused on the Hendra virus and the Nipah virus. Um, so together that represents a, a genus of Hen 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 H
Peromyxoviridae, a very virulent, uh, very pathogenic viruses. They essentially are transmitted when people interact with, uh, when bats interact with domestic wildlife, domestic animals that interact in areas of dense human population. So that describes a, a, quite a few areas on the planet. So we essentially wanted to understand, you know, what is the current distribution of these 15 different species of bats where um, dense human populations are in fact exposed to Hanipa viruses, and how might the distribution of those bat species be altered under regimes of future climates? Um, so here is, this is sort of what we started with. This is, if you go to the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, and you take the total extent of area polygons that are um, represented for these 15 different bat species, um, this, is, this is the map that you get. So this is the distribution map from IUCN, almost certainly an overestimate, since those extent of polygon occurrence records are really quite um, tend to be an overestimate, so when you combine 15 of them, but this is the sort of the starting map of the distribution of the hosts for the Hanipa virus. Of course, um, if you begin with this kind of a distribution map and then model its distribution under climate change, you know, you don't want to begin with an overestimate in something like this. So we wanted a much more precise understanding of the distribution of these um, of these bat vectors for, for these emerging infectious diseases. And so we went to GBIF and we looked at um, the 15 different species of, of bats, many of which are fruit bats, so not technically the same as most bats. Um, and we were able to download, and this was a while ago, this study was published in 2013 and took three rounds of arguing with reviewers, so we actually did most of the downloading all the way back in 2011. Um, but we were able to download the, uh, the geo-referenced information that was required to undertake a species distribution modeling effort under both current and future climactic regimes. So in addition to occurrence data, it was important to get um, environmental information for input into species distribution models. And at the time, really the best source of global data for ecologically relevant climactic variables uh, was WorldClim and the, sort of the, the bioclimatic variables, 19 different bioclimatic variables derived from monthly minimum temperature, monthly maximum temperature, and monthly total precipitation that have been very widely used in the literature, especially when modeling at these large spatial scales, right? I mean, the distribution of these bat species covers half a, a hemisphere. So um, at large spatial scales, the world clim, uh, bioclim data set has proven very useful. And then at that time, my lab was at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, and we sort of brazenly undertook the downscaling of uh, about 20 different climate models from the IPCC's fourth assessment report um, using an interpolated delta technique. Uh, we created future time slices for every decade through 2100 under three different emission scenarios at a global spatial resolution of 10 kilometers. Um, we're not using this data set anymore, but at the time it was a, it, sort of the perfect data set that we needed to investigate um, how different climate models projected different future distributions for these 20 bat species, 15 bat species, and to be able to look across different climate models for the degree of model agreement. So we had some estimate of um, uncertainty in our future projections. So I, I'm not at all going to belabor uh, species distribution modeling, but essentially I've just reviewed the three essential components that we needed. We had to have occurrence records, which we found from GBIF. We had to have environmental records um, for both the current and the future. And uh, we used the maximum entropy species distribution modeling algorithm at that time, um, which has been shown to be most effective with presence-only data, which is what we have when we download GBIF observations, or, or actually most observation records. So then we took two different approaches to asking this question. We, you know, one is an approach uh, trying to understand how species richness might change in the future, and then the other approach is one looking at what is the degree of model agreement about the distribution of any one of these 15 hosts. Um, so this is just a cartoon sort of reflecting, let's, let's first examine what are the shifts in species density, right? Are, are we going to move from, you know, two species to 12 species that suddenly occur in an area under future climatic regimes? Um, 
And so we begin, of course, with a, a map of the potential present distribution. So here, the, the richer, the more red colors is high probability of the highest number of species. So that this is for the present day. Um, this is our baseline, right? So we've taken observation data used current bioclimatic conditions and created a, a current model of species richness across um, the locations where these 15 bat species currently occur. And so um, notice, especially for India here, there's only high species richness in the very edges of the coast. Um, uh, throughout Southeast Asia, this is the, the place where um, these bat species and in fact Hendra virus and Nipah virus cases are currently recorded. And there are no currently recorded uh, Hanipa virus cases from Africa, although there is the potential distribution of quite a few bat species there. So now we're projecting into mid-century, the 2050s. We've just used one scenario of future greenhouse gas emissions, which is a relatively aggressive scenario of an increase in greenhouse gases, um, one that we're actually undershooting at the moment. And so we're looking at the shift in distribution of bat species richness, but we've just taken all 20 of the climate models that we used and created a single ensemble average. So we're just saying under one possible future climate scenario, what is the shift in bat species richness? And you can see here in India a very significant increase under this um, 20 model ensemble of future climate conditions. So many more species of bats will find that the climactic conditions are suitable throughout a larger part of India. Southeast Asia remains sort of under attack, but it's currently there already. So that's not new, but it may be increased in prevalence. And much more region of Central Africa has much more species richness under this um, particular modeling effort. We can also take a second approach of looking at the variability across global climate models. And this is one of the sort of one of the most paralyzing issues about dealing with um, future projections of who's going to live where under climate change is that there's so much uncertainty in these forecasts. I mean, depending on what time slice you use, what variables you use, which global climate model you use, which emission scenario you use, which distribution modeling algorithm you use, there, there's all these choices that one has to make in exploring sort of future conditions of where distributions of biodiversity may be. And so one of the um, aspects that is under our control in making future projections is to look at a whole lot of different climate models and seek understanding of where do they agree with one another. Um, so if you choose you know, a single time slice, a single modeling algorithm, uh, a single emission scenario, and look across many different climate models, that gives us a degree of confidence when we find that a whole lot of different climate models are agreeing that the same area may, may present suitable bioclimate for a given taxon. So, this is, so, so in order to look across all the 20 climate models, what we've done is uh, combined all of the occurrences from all 15 species. So you might think of that this as the current potential distribution of the Hanipa virus super bat. This is like all the 15 bat species um, sort of merged into one so that any, any of these areas are potential current distribution for any one of these 15 bat species. So um, sort of the global potential distribution of the Hanipa virus super bat. Um, and then we looked at, so we took this sort of, this is, represents essentially the baseline of the bioclimate for any of these 15 species, all of which harbor the Hendra or Nipah viruses. Then we asked this question across 20 different climate models. So if we, if we look at that current um, distribution of the super bat, what is its distribution under 20 different versions of future climates? And then we synthesize those into a map that gives you the degree of model agreement. So in any one pixel, anywhere from 1, which is dark green, to 20, which is 100, any, anywhere um, in that spectrum, any one of the climate models could agree that that pixel, and this is a 10 kilometer resolution, is suitable for the, di for the distribution of one of these 
uh, 15 bat species, all, all examined here collectively. So um, if we go back from this potential distribution and look into the future distribution, there's a really high agreement in, in the general geographic areas, but there's a lot of places where essentially every single future climate model suggests an expansion of one or more of these bat species that, carry, that currently carry this virus into new areas. So um, particularly in India, there are actually, there's very high model agreement of a much greater geographic area being subject to um, the Hendra or Nipra virus uh, vectors, the bat vectors. There's a, a broad increase in Africa. These areas here that are, already, that are red, they are already harboring these bat species, although there is a penetration more into the interior of the continent of Australia. One of the things we can do with information like this for decision makers, because especially if you're red, green, colorblind and a decision maker, this is not the map you want to be looking at. Um, actually, this one isn't either, <laughs> I just realized. Um, so we can, we can say, okay, based on some kind of threshold of model agreement, in this case, a fairly rigorous threshold of model agreement, um, where can we just say that the current conditions will, are projected to remain stable by mid-century? So that is places where the bioclimate is suitable today, will they remain suitable by mid-century? Where are the places where actually conditions are suitable today that may no longer be suitable in the future? Because that's sort of the other part of the story we don't hear that much about, is that some shifting distributions will actually go in our favor, where the current conditions are suitable and in the future it may not be. In this case, it's represented by the, the blue areas, which are, are not so prevalent. And then the red areas represent expansion uh, into new habitats according to... 75% of the models. So 15 out of 20 models had to agree in order to even create a map like this, which is fairly high model, excuse me, fairly high model agreement when you're projecting, you know, 40 or 50 years out into the future. Uh, one of the ways that you can use a map uh, information like this, um, because of course, it's not just about bioclimate, right? It's about interactions, for example, of human density um, so this is a map where the darker areas are the influence of human population density. And this may in part explain why we haven't seen that much emergence of Hanipa virus in Africa, even though the bats are there and the bioclimate is suitable there, is because the population density is relatively low there compared to a country like India. These red dots that aren't showing up that well, these are current outbreaks of Hendra and Nipah virus in India. So it is here, it is prevalent and the human population density sort of encourages the transfer of the virus from its bat vector to domestic animals, to human populations. So we can use this information integrated with other data sources to anticipate public health outbreaks. Um, and finally, we can look at the, projected, the, the projections for where else in the world, right, outside of the old world, might the conditions suitable for um, these vectors exist. Now, in this case, the bat vector, you know, our species distribution models don't take into consideration um, generally how species are going to get from one place to another. But in a world of the extraordinary sort of interconnectivity that we have and um, the inter inter global commerce that we have, it's not out of the question that somehow one of these vectors could make it to the Americas, and if they were to make it to the Americas, where would they find a place that they could exist? And that's largely in South America, and in fact, um, under future conditions, large parts of South America would exhibit suitable bioclimate for any one of these 15 species. Um, so that's the sort of the short version of the story where based ex essentially exclusively on georeferenced um, taxonomically accurate data that we were able to get from GBIF, that is the foundation of a story like this, which allows us to look at how um, things that have true costs in terms of dollars and in terms of human health, in terms of lost productivity, uh, to be able to use GBIF data to then apply widely used tools such as species distribution modeling under, the, uh, under future climate conditions, uh, that th these kinds of questions would not even be possible to ask, certainly not within sort of the time frame and funding constraints that our study faced, 
being able to go to GBIF, download that data, and conduct this, this kind of a story and have it be um, you know, published in a widely recognized journal. Uh, we were, were incredibly grateful to GBIF as a resource that would allow us to get a study like this done. Um, I think s since then, there's been actually some field research by EcoHealth Alliance in br the Brazilian Amazon, and they, are, they, they think that they have actually found Henipa virus in some of the areas that were predicted to be suitable. That was good. <laughs> um, that were predicted to be suitable uh, in, in Latin America. Um, so let me just give you one last. See if this will work. Okay, I had one last. Yo, here we go. I do. I got it. Um, so I just want. I had one last acknowledgement slide here. Uh, again, I am not an expert in public health. Uh, my lab did the downscaling of the climate models and the species range shift modeling, um, and so I was very fortunate to work with Dr. Peter Dazik and his team at EcoHealth Alliance. Um, Miguel Fernandez and Otto Alvarez were the two members of my lab that most contributed to this work. And I'm very grateful again to Tim Hirsch and the, the GBIF organizing committee for inviting me to speak about this. Um, and especially to all of you for actually funding the resources, uh, providing the resources that allow a researcher like myself and Dr. Dazik to undertake such a, a study. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. That was, was a great, a somewhat scary um, presentation. Uh, one quick question while we change slides. John? Yeah. I would like to thank very much Kelly for the presentation, also the importance of the subject. Um, really, environmental data are very important in life modeling. Uh, but among the, the environmental data, um, let's say the Climatic data or parameters are not the only to affect the distribution of species. Um, my question is, um, is there any barrier, any barrier of the distribution, spatial distribution of the species, of the bats? And if there are environmental or let's say physical barrier, for instance, for their distribution. How did you account for this in your model? So the question has to do with um, the fact that the environmental data, the, the largely climactic data, is not the sole determinant of any given species distribution. And in our case, for these 15 species of bats, are there non-climate data that would provide some kind of a barrier to their distribution? And if so, how did we take that into consideration? Uh, so the answer is we, we did not use any other data besides the 19 bioclimatic variables. Um, our rationale is uh, most of these bats, and especially the ones that most often end up being the vector for the translation of Hendra or Nipah virus to human populations, are fruit bats. And the fruit bats are very tightly connected to trees, which are very tightly connected to temperature and precipitation regimes. And um, because they're, they're sort of omnivorous when it comes to fruit, it's not like it's this particular tree that only grows in this soil, that only grows in this you know, slope or aspect of a particular mountain. They, they will, most of those species will, are sort of omnivorous frugivores. <laughs> frugivores. Uh, and so um, that was actually a question that we were asked by one of the reviewers who was sort of satisfied with the answer that because most of these bats are very tightly connected to fruiting trees and the trees themselves are very connected to temperature and precipitation regimes, that that's as, that's as far as we went with this particular study. But it's an important observation that you are making. Thank you.